Say hi. Alrighty, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Crystal Erickson. I will be your facilitator for today. Um, we are starting today at the 12 o'clock um, live panel, which is actually opening up a beehive uh, with UC Riverside Bayer Lab. Today we have with us graduate students and Dr. Barbara Bayer as well, who will be answering questions and helping out the students. Um, but it's a very exciting time. We ask for you all, if you have any questions regarding the process or anything like that, please be sure to go ahead and comment down below. At the very end of the presentation, I will be sure to go ahead and reiterate any questions that were asked, and the students and Dr. Bear will be able to answer any of those. So go ahead, um, you guys can go ahead and take it away. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Webb. I am a second year PhD student, uh, and my current research is working on a medication for managed honeybees for this disease known as Nozema. You guys may or may not hear about it later, but uh, we'll see. Genesis? Hi, my name is Genesis Chan. I'm an international student from Panama. If you have any question in Spanish, Yo puedo ayudar. I can help with that as well. Um, I'm a third year in entomology department. I'm studying study honeybee health. Particularly, I'm working with varroa mite. It's one of the biggest threats for, for the honeybees. And I'm trying to figure it out like um, healthy bees to mitigate the mite. Hello everyone, my name is Rola. I'm a PhD student. I'm a visiting scholar from Australia. I'm here as a visitor to UCR to do my research. Uh, my research is focusing in using sensors. So we're trying to know the difference between healthy and unhealthy bees using the sensors. Okay, I'll get you back to the team to show you the hive. All right, and as I said, today we're gonna just open a beehive for you um, and show you all the cool things that we can possibly find. Uh, so right now we're here at our teaching yard at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, and it looks like we have about 15 colonies in our yard right now. Uh, and so this is what a single colony would look like. Uh, as you can see, it contains a, a box. Uh, and this here is going to be your hive entrance where your bees are going to be able to enter and exit. Uh, this is just your lid. Um, and then there's going to be a bunch of cool things inside once we get there. Uh, but before we get there, we have a bunch of bee tools that we need to show you guys before we can even open the hive. It is smoker. This is a very important tool for you to open the hive because bees will distract the bees. So when you smoke, you start smoking the entrance, and then the bee will start focusing on protect their honey because they will get focused from that. So then you can go and open the hat. It does not hurt to be real. Uh, it's just a distraction. So did you hear that? So we use the smoker before we open the hive to distract the bees and uh, we'll give them a warning and it doesn't harm them at all. Then we have the brush tool and the hive tool. These two tools are very important because with these, these will help you to open the hive and to move the frames and these you will like gently brush the bees in case that you need it and these won't harm the bees. 
Okay, so the two tools just uh, Jennifer show you is one is the high tool and we use it to separate the frames and to open the high because the bees use the bubbles and they, it's like glue. They stuck everything to each other. So it's so it's sticky inside the hive and we need this tool to separate the stuff and make it easy to move the stuff. The other uh, tool she show you is the brush and we use it to brush the bees out of the frame without harming them. If we want to see something in the hive, we just gently push them away. So it doesn't kill them, it doesn't hurt them or anything. All right. And now let's go ahead and get it open. So what you're looking at right now is a the top lid, uh, sometimes called the telescoping lid. Uh, but once you open it, you'll see that there is a second lid that we refer to as the inner lid. Do you want to go ahead? And so we're going to use our high tool to just kind of pry open the top lid because as Rola said, um, there's a lot of wax and propolis that the bees use to uh, glue down the lid to keep themselves and their honey and their babies all nice and safe. All bees that you can see here around the lid is bubbly. So that's like, a, as Rola said, it's kind of like a glue. So look at them. They look so beautiful and here for us seems like a mess for but for them it's like a very organized colony they are just like here you can see how they are like drinking honey because we smoke them yeah uh, just like Judas said to us it may look like a mess uh, but to them, it's their home. So just like we have a living room in our house, it's like we have a kitchen. They have the same sort of organizational system where they keep certain things in certain places. Uh, so as we move through this frame, we'll try to point those types of things out to you guys. All right. And so we'll be first begin by giving them a gentle smoke. So hopefully they'll go further down into their colony so that we aren't disturbing them too much. You can see that they're moving down once you spray them with the smoke. Okay, so this top box here is actually what we call a honey super. Uh, so inside of this box, you will see honeycomb whenever I can get it open. So this is what honey would look like. And they keep it in a separate box from where they would keep all of their uh, their babies and their eggs. So if you look here, we have the down box where the babies and the eggs and the queen exist. And then we have the top box where it's only honey. So the worker can go up and they can de uh, deposit the honey they collect in the top. So when we harvest the honey, we harvest it from the top box, which we call it the super. So now we're going to go ahead and take this honey super up so we can get into the bottom box. It's a little bit heavy. Yeah, it's very heavy. It's also very sticky, which is why we have our hive to it. You can see that the hive, the hive tool become handy to disattach to the top box. Okay. And so right here, what you're looking at this metal piece is called a queen excluder. Um, it allows us to keep the queen bee in the bottom box. And that way she's not allowed to lay eggs inside of your honey, which as I can imagine, no one wants to eat bee eggs in their honey. So I'm going to use the smoker again. To just move these guys out of the way. Okay, did right. you hear that? So this middle piece is called the queen exploder and it keeps the queen in the bottom because it has small holes. It's allow only to the worker to be able to go to the top. The queen is bigger in the size. She cannot go through the hole. 
So the only the workers can go to the top and they can deposit the honey in the top. All the eggs and the larvae will be down because you don't want to eat honey with larvae. Okay, and so right now what you're looking at is, as we said, the bottom box. Uh, inside the bottom box, we have 10 frames. Uh, so a frame is just these single frames that we have in the box. And so we'll begin to uh, take these out and then point out all of the different things that we can see. Uh, so we'll start with the, the first frame. Let me get that started. Again, we're using the hive tool to separate the frames from each other, so it's easy to pull it out. It's important to move very slow with these guys. As you can see, this frame is bigger than the one that we use in the in the honey super. So here you can see like this is the the frames on the on the corner. The bees oh. use it to put the honey and do storage pollen. Here you can see like the spots where the bees storage the pollen. Look at how beautiful it it is and the colors that you can watch and um, all around it's between nectar. These are nectar. Getting ready. Yeah. So here in the corner you can yeah. see the pollen and the pollen have different color because it's coming from the plant flower. So right here you have yellow, but sometimes we'll get purple or a bright red, mm -hmm. just depends on where. Woo! Um, Exciting. Yeah, it just depends on where uh, the bees will get their pollen from. Okay, and so as you guys might know, most honeybees are actually females. Uh, so the majority of the bees that you see on this frame are going to be females. Um, they all have three body parts, which is going to be your head, your thorax, which is the middle part. And then you have your abdomen. Uh, these have four wings, as opposed to most flies, which for all flies, they only have two. Um, they also have these cool antenna, which they use a lot for communication purposes. Um, and so all of your worker bees are going to be female. But there are also what we call drone bees, and those are going to be your males. So this is you have one to see. Here! We yeah. have a male. If you can see, the males are a bit bigger. But one interesting thing about the males is that they don't sting. They don't have a sting. And all the females, mm -hmm. like the worker sister, will take care of them until they are ready to fly out and find a queen. Yes. Um, can you hold this male from the high stool? It's because it's really okay. Yes. Yeah. Now we can have we have the male over there. The males are kind of cute. They they're super fuzzy and they have really big eyes. So they're really easy to identify inside of a hive. And the males are only seasonal. Mostly for spring, summer. summer. They only live about three to six weeks. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so this time we'll move on to our next one. Okay, so recap what they're saying is the male is bigger than the worker. They have this huge big eye, so oh. you know that is the male. And they don't have a stinger, so they peaceful. They cannot sting you. It's only the worker female who have the stinger. So again, we just have another frame. It's a really full frame. There's a lot of drones. Um, it looks like they have a lot of pollen.
here you can see all of the pollen that they're storing. We have more drones here. Can you see the color of the pollen? Some of it is a little orange, and then you have some nice yellow ones, some darker yellow ones. Lots of worker bees. And earlier I mentioned that most of the, the bees in the hive are going to be female. Uh, but there's one really important female that we should be on the lookout for. Uh, and that's going to be, I haven't found it yet. And that's going to be our queen bee. Uh, there's only one in the entire colony. And she is responsible for laying all of the eggs. Um, she can lay about 2,000 in a single day. Wow, that's a lot of eggs. Yeah. Um, and so we'll be on the lookout for eggs and larvae, which are your your growing eggs before they become a uh, brood, which is just your older larvae, and then your tallow bees, which are your bees that have just been born. Uh, so we'll typically see that when we get closer to the center of the hive. Okay, so the eggs is the most important thing for the hive, and the babies is the most important thing, so they keep them safe in the middle. So mostly we will find the eggs and the larvae, the babies will be in the middle. So it looks like on this particular frame, we have what is called brood or cat brood. Um, so as you can see in the frames, you have these cells here. So if you were to open them, you would see bees that are currently growing. So your baby bees are right before they are ready to hatch. Oh yeah. And so right here, this little guy here, he actually, or she actually just hatched not too long ago. You can tell because she's really lightly colored. Um, and she almost looks kind of wet. Okay. Yes. So this big cell. Yeah. So this bigger looking cell here is what we call drone cone. Um, so this is where our drones are going to be made. So the cells are obviously going to be bigger because the drones are bigger. Then a little further down, we have larvae. Can you see it? Then these cells here, these little, they almost look like little white worms, but they are our larvae. Can you brush the bees away? Yeah. Gonna pull out our bee brush so that we can get a closer look at that. But you always, when you brush your bees, we need to do it gently. Can you see the larvae? These little cells here. The, the white stuff inside the cell? Yes. And so at this point, we should be on the lookout for our queen because this Take is where, one she, of the is larvae out, hold it out. where mm -hmm. she is beginning to lay eggs. So Jessica now is pulling one of the larvae out to show it to you. Can you see that? So this is before it becomes a cat brood. Okay, as you can see here, the brood is from the females 
And these working females are young females that are known as nurses. So the nurses are the ones in charge of the basic needs of the of the brood. They take care of them. And something very interesting is that sometimes the brood can send signals to the nurses to let them know when they are when they have threats, like when they are sick or when they have mice or just when they are very hungry. Okay, so the baby's bees is like our babies. When they want something, they cry. But the bees cannot cry, but they make a smell. Yeah, like Genesis said, bees do have jobs. Um, so throughout the hive, you'll see other different jobs, such as barred bees. Uh, and those bees are going to be responsible for guarding the hive. Uh, so if ants or wasps were to, hmm? oh, okay. So if ants or wasps were to enter into the hive, um, those guard bees would be able to take care of it. Um, and we have found our queen. So she's buried under this mm -hmm. nice pile of bees. Uh, yeah, the queen always will be with company, so nurses be, will be her cohort, and they will be in charge of taking care of the bee basic needs. This is what is known as a royal court. She has the blue dot in her, you can see. We marked her, so it's easy to us to see her in the frame. Internationally, the colors are decided um, by the by the committee, and last year the color was blue. That's why you can notice that our queen has a blue dot. The, the color of G this year is white. So as you see, the bees around her are constantly making sure that she's okay, cleaning her, feeding her, uh, even picking up her poop. So hopefully this girl will start laying some eggs. All right. She she con uh, it's so hard to keep up with the queen. She consistently keeps moving. But I hope you can see her here. If you can hold the frame hold still. She's this member with the long body. Yes. So is she bigger than the other worker? People often wonder how a queen becomes a queen. Um, anybody want to explain me? The worker bees from a young age feed her what is known as royal jelly. Uh, this allows her abdomen to become larger than other worker bees. Um, and it also gives her the ability to lay eggs, which the other females cannot do. So in the event that the queen becomes sick or she just reaches her age limit, uh, the worker bees will start to um, prepare a new queen so they can lay these eggs and they'll feed them uh, royal jelly. And so when the new queen emerges, they essentially have to fight with the old queen in order to, um, I guess, take power. You see her in the middle with the blue dot. It looks like she might be actually trying to find a cell to lay eggs in. Yes, yeah, so she's searching for an empty cell to lay eggs. So if you see, she, she keeps dropping her abdomen. Um, she's looking for an empty cell. Okay. 
Okay. So I guess now we can see if we can actually find some eggs which she previously laid. Uh, so I don't think I've seen any on that frame, so we can move on to the next one. No, keep her in the side. So the frame where you have your queen, you never laid it out because the queen can escape if she falls. Okay. And so the queen, if she falls dangerous, she will fly away. Can you spot any eggs? I have not been able to spot any eggs. This is a really healthy colony, though. You can tell by the amount of pollen and the amount of food that they have. I see really young larvae. It's a lot smaller than um, the big larvae that I pulled out earlier. And so it's going to be closer to egg size, but it's not quite an egg. Jessica, can you explain how the life cycle of the bees, how they turn from egg to full developed adult bee? Uh, yeah. So, do you know how long their, their life cycle actually takes? 21 days. Okay. So, in its 21 day period, Oh, okay. Well, in this in this period, uh, essentially the queen lays the egg, as we just talked about, uh, and from there, uh, the nursery bees that that Genesis talked about will continuously um, look after this egg until they then become a a small larvae. Uh, they then feed this larvae pollen, uh, which allows them to continually grow uh, until they reach the the larger larvae stage that I that I was able to show you guys. Um, and from there, the bees eventually cap them with this waxy like substance, which is again this this um, this brood that I was showing you guys. And so once the once the pupa. the larvae inside, huh? Pupa. Pupa. Yes. Once the pupa uh, becomes large enough, it eventually. Um, chews on the waxy um, cap until it's able to emerge and it becomes one of those uh, callow bees, the really white young bees that I was able to show you guys earlier. Can you spot any bees that's showing its way out? Let's see what I can find. Genesis, do you have any over there maybe? Or you can show pupa. So if you can see here, uh, this is the top fruit. So before they hatch, the bees is like put in wax and cover them. And once the bees, the bees is ready to hatch, they show in their way out. So they eat in the wax and circle around themselves and they get their head out. I see a couple that have their head in, but they're actually either eating or they are currently cleaning out the comb. As Jessica told you about the queen that the other workers can prepare other queens, here we have an example of how it looks a cell for a queen. So usually workers sometimes tend to build this type of of a structure to start to rear a queen. So they will feed them with ro royal jelly and but probably these cells it's 
empty because the queen looks to be like a very strong queen. So the cells of the queen is different than the cells where they keep the worker and the male. This, is, this cell is much bigger and it's hanging out. You can see it here. It's going down like it's different direction than the other cells and to use it to rear the queen on it. And as Jessica and Genesis said, the difference between the regular food for the bees and the queen, that the queen eat the royal gel, which is make it bigger. So Jessica tries to get larvae out. Once she's successful, we'll show you larvae. Oh, she's getting one. So this is how big the larvae is going to look in it's going to look in your cap blue frame. Um, so as Genesis said, the workers do have different jobs. Um, and, you'll leave it here. and one so of their short. jobs is to be an undertaker and or cleaners. Um, so your cleaners are going to actually uh, clean out your cells that have been used. Uh, whether that's for honey or for brew, their job is to clean. Uh, but then you have undertaker bees. Uh, so those guys will actually remove anything that is dead from the hive, uh, whether that's larva, pupa, or um, dead bees. And probably most of you will be a bit confused if you watch the, the bee movie, because in the movie, the bees choose the task what they want to do, but in real life, in the hive, bees doesn't choose their tasks. As they are growing, the tasks are changing. And so the bees get the chance to do all the work, but it's based on their age. Once they hatch, they have a job. Once they grow a little bit older, they get the time to do another job. Once they get older, they get a third job. So their job is uh, changed based on the age. So when they are young adults, they are in charge of, of inside child. And as they are growing, they are going to change as words or foraging. So they will go out and look for nectar, pollen. And those are like more... Dangerous jobs. Yeah. Uh, so as we know, uh, in a bee colony, there are usually 40,000 to 80,000 uh, individual bees. Uh, so they have to have a way to communicate. Uh, and one of those ways is pheromones, of course, which just means that they can um, secrete different smells that tells them different things. Um, so if the bees felt threatened by me, they would secrete what is called an alarm pheromone. Uh, we know that that kind of smell is like a citrusy or banana-y smell. Um, the queen also secretes her own special pheromone so that the bees are aware of where she is at all times. Uh, but they can also communicate through what is known as a waggle dance. Uh, does anybody want to explain the waggle dance? Okay. Well, the waggle dance is... Uh, it's basically just a dance that the bees do, um, and through that dance, the forager bees are able to tell uh, different bees where food sources are. So if I was able to... So if the bees find good food sources, they communicate it by dancing. They come back to the hive, they dance, they wiggle their, uh, like their body, and they move to different directions to point to that direction to their sister to go and grab food from there. Said, oh, I tried this restaurant. It's so good. Go get your food from there. Yeah. Trying to see if I could find one. Doesn't look like it. Though. As you can see, we're working our way through the hive, uh, and we're now closer to our back end. So we're going to be moving away from all of the brood, the eggs, uh, the larvae, the pupa, and we're probably going to start seeing more food 
sources at this point. Uh, so we're going to be back to seeing our nectar in our pollen. So the water, the honey is also what source of insulation. So they use it in the two sides as insulation from the heat and the cold. You know, I haven't seen any pollen baskets. Um, so when bees go out to forage, uh, one of the things they bring back is pollen. Uh, so they have these special structures on their legs that allows them to hold pollen there. Uh, and then once they're back into the beehive, they are able to uh, deposit this pollen into the cells, as we have showed you before. Um, and we haven't been able to find any bees that look like they've been out this morning because I guess it's still kind of early and it was a bit chilly today, so we might not be able to find them. So this structure is like baskets attached to their legs. Once they go to the flower, they collect the pollen and stick it inside this basket. And once they get back home, they empty this basket in the cells. It's like going for grocery shopping. Once they get home, they have to empty the bag. And so the cells that they store all of their food in is actually made out of wax. Um, this wax takes quite a lot of energy for them to produce. Uh, they secrete it out of the land. It's almost kind of like how we sweat, but they, they secrete wax. So this gland is uh, placed in their abdomen, and they produce this wax, and they use it to build the cells in the hive. We also use this wax um, for many different purposes. One is for candle making. Sorry, what? Okay, so next time. Another cool product Abdomen. is lip balm. Oh, yeah. Can you explain the abdomen with the bees? So like you we were saying, this wax comes from their abdomens. Uh, the abdomen is just these, these really, the longer parts of the bee, sometimes referred to as the butt, but that's not the proper term. Uh, and as we showed you for the queen, this is, um, it's a lot longer, um, but for these guys, it's just this end part. Uh, they also use it for scent fanning, um, which is kind of how they secrete their, um, their pheromones. Um, when they're uh, guard bees, they'll, they'll have that part facing up to kind of make themselves look bigger and more threatening. Okay, so the bees use smell to communicate with their language. We use our words, they use, use their smell. And uh, as Jen uh, Jessica says, the alarm hormone is smell like banana or citrus, like orange or something. So once um, they sting you, they produce this smell, and this smell is attracting another bee to sting the same area. And this is how they manage to make it more painful for us when they sting in the same area so many times. Is um, the effect or the feeling of the pain is more intense than if this thing in different parts of our body. So we've looked at all 10 points and we finally found some eggs. Okay, we found eggs. We're not sure if we're going to be able to see them. Can you take it this angle toward the sun and then we'll try to film it from here. 
I can see the larvae, but I eat the eggs. I lose focus once I'm trying to show the eggs. It's little dots, it's white dots, it looks like rice grain. Uh, once we get the cone closer, it's, uh, it lose the focus. Let me put it and then I can. Yes. If you try to get one out, it would be easier to show. With the tweezers? Here. Like, between yeah. my finger and the light. I, uh, yeah, I can see it with my eye, but I don't know if they can see it with the phone. They're going to be really hard to see. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? I can't really see it in the phone, but I can see it with my naked eye. <laughs> Believe us, they're there. <laughs> we know they're there. Trust us, they are there. Okay. So we've been through all 10 frames. I think we've shown everything that we wanted to show. Can you talk about the Nozema disease? Nozema disease, yeah. Uh, so Nozema is a score uh, that the that bees will get. Um, they can get it in many different ways. They can get it from cleaning themselves or from uh, digesting food that's contaminated with the score. Uh, and so it's really bad for the bees. It makes them feel bad. It makes them, uh, it makes their stomach uh, extend, well, swell. Um, uh, and also they get diarrhea. Yeah, they get diarrhea. But the good thing about the bees, and this is how we guarantee that our honey is always clean, that they don't poop inside their hive. So they, when they need to poop, they need to leave the hive and poop outside. So this is they keep their clean uh, hive. Yeah. So oftentimes, if you see a hive that has nozema, uh, you will see a lot of bee poop on the outside. It'll look like this, but it'll be a lot more. So that's why I'm working on a medication uh, in order to help the bees to not contract this uh, infection so much. Uh, the bees also get uh, other types of diseases and parasites and infections. Uh, and one such parasite being gorilla, which Genesis works on a little bit, so maybe she can uh, kind of talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, we will go to that in a second, but just to recap with the nozema. So the nozema is um, gut disease, and it comes to the bees from infected food. A very, very tiny fungus. And also from cleaning each other, because the bees is a uh, social organism, they work and groom in each other, they clean each other, so they can get that from, if they clean sick bees, they can get that. So Jessica is working to find medication for that, and to help them survive. And uh, Genesis is working with the Faroa, and the Faroa is the monster for the bees, because it's opening a gate for whole new disease world for the bees. But yes, as Rola told you, um, I'm working with Varroa mite. It's a very tiny, tiny mite. It's brown and it's a very sneaky mite that it will stick on the abdomen of the bee, as Jessica showed you. And this little mite will use the bee to reproduce their own offspring and uh, to feed and just to have a life because this mite it's a parasite so it needs the bee to be able to to survive and this is like one of the biggest stress for honeybees because as you know honeybees are important for pollination and bees are moved around to different parts of the world and sometimes when people move them around they have diseases and that's how varroa mites spread all around the world and these mites are vectors what i mean about vectors they are like bridge for other diseases to 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 transmit to the to the bees to the honeybees. So they bite the bees and they suck their blood or the right? Is that right, Jason? Fat body. The fat body of them. Like the 
and weaken them and make them more susceptible for another disease, right? Yeah. Uh, and one of the ways that we can monitor these types of diseases is through sensors, which our lab is currently working on. And maybe Rola can um, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so that part is my project. So we're trying uh, to identify the difference between healthy colony and unhealthy colony. As you can see, sitting and opening hive by hive is taking so much time. And uh, for beekeepers who have like more than 100 hives, it's hard job to do it. And it's hard for them to detect the, um, disease like um, in, in the early stage for the bees to be able to save them. So uh, my sensor, we try to find early sign of the collapse of the colony so we can save them. So if they have mesema, for example, uh, the, the sensor will tell us uh, you need to treat your colony for mesema. And also if they have coroa, uh, we use a thymol, which is the treatment for uh, kicking the, uh, the coroa away because they don't like the smell and it killed them as well. So uh, we uh, use this treatment in our hives to protect it. So the thymol level is have to be at certain level. If it's too high, it's going to kill the bees. If it's so low, it can um, not be effective against the varroa. So the, the bees still have the varroa. So it needs to be in the right level. And the bad thing about the thymol is affected by the temperature. So if it's so hot, it evaporates so fast, and if it's cold, it evaporates less. So uh, the, the sensor will be able to read the thymol level inside the hive. So that's how the thymol level is so low, you need to retreat, or it's high, we need to reduce the amount of thymol in the hive. So uh, I'm starting the first step of identifying the biomarker of the healthy hive and unhealthy hive, and we can detect that by the sensor. Maybe in the coming years, it will be functional, and uh, hopefully we can see it in each hive. And here we have a very important person for the bees, our beekeeper. Hi, everyone. Hope you enjoyed uh, taking a look inside one of our hives here at UCR. So Jamie is our beekeeper who taking care of all the hive over here because uh, it's hard job. We need to keep them healthy and strong. So when there is not a lot of food around us, uh, Jamie makes a sugary solution and I feed it to each of the hives. Uh, maybe we can show you one of the feed that we put it at the top of the hive when it's uh, not a lot of resources around us. We'll go around this hive here. Oh, we have one here. So Jamie is opening this box. And in the top of the box, we put um, this feeder. So if we just flip it, it's a jar with the sugary solution, like 50-50. And it has a hole on it, and you can see the bees use it to drink. Leave it in the top of the hive so where they can have access to it. And we put the lid back and we put the spray in the top of the lid so the lid doesn't fly away when it's so windy. The ant also is a problem because they're trying to steal the, the resources from the hive. Uh, and we use this method to keep them away. So this is a container containing oil and water so in the, the ants cannot access to the hive. Oh, we have here our friends who are waiting any good bees to eat. Can you see him? Hello? This is our leather friend who feeds on dead bees in the front of the hive. And so with that, we packed the hive back up, we put it in the correct order that they had uh, before we undid everything. And so if there's any questions that weren't answered in the chat, if you guys want to see anything, let us know. So if you need to see something specific 
or there is something we missed and we didn't film it well. If you want to see it, now is your chance. Um, we did receive a few questions on Facebook, but I don't think they are specific to the beehive. They are just specific to bees. Um, if somebody has um, a beehive at home, what would you suggest for them to do for a removal? Maybe I can take this question. So if you have a hive at home and you want to pick it up, uh, you want to have it removed, uh, there are professional bee removalists who can do that for you. Um, it depends also whether the hive bothers anybody. If the hive does not bother anybody, you can just leave it there. Thank you for that, Dr. Bray. Um, now, if somebody is interested in purchasing the honey from UCR, is that an option? At the moment, the honey, uh, we, uh, our hives produce, we uh, give that to, sell that to dining services here on campus because as a university um, lab, we are not allowed to um, be in competition with professionals who sell honey or wax or such. So if we uh, we sell it to dining services who then uses it in salad dressings or in coffees and at the cafe on campus that will reopen once this virus is open uh, over, then you can taste it in coffees at the cafe called Emmerby's. That's the big cafe here uh, at UCR on campus. And uh, the money from if they make a profit, if dining services makes a profit, we ha we get part of that profit and that will pay for our beekeeper. Thank you. I am going ahead and I'm reviewing our Facebook questions that we have received. Let me see if we have any additional ones here. I am not seeing any at the moment, um, but again, if you guys have questions, please be sure to go ahead and comment down below and then we can get these um, questions answered for you. Um, so we'll give people a moment to go ahead and ask, but in the meantime, I just would like to say thank you so much for giving this opportunity to share, you know, the life of bees. It's definitely eye-opening and wonderful to see how, it, you know, bees are reproduced and then in addition to that, how they help our community as well. So thank you. It's a welcome. Actually, let's, can we go ahead and share one or two questions that were asked by the schools? Um, so today on our Facebook Live um, and as well on our Zoom presentation, we have a few schools that joined us today. And one of the questions is, how do bees sting? So bees have a stinger that looks like a very, very tiny needle at the back of their body. On, on the abdomen, which is the back side of their body. You know how bees have a head and then a middle part and then the abdomen and on the back they have a little stinger that the stinger looks like a tiny, tiny needle. And uh, normally that's retracted with a muscle inside of their body. But when we sit on them or we bother them, then they, uh, they use that muscle and they sting you. The stinger sticks in your skin and then there is a poison gland attached to it that still pumps poison. But the bee flies off without that poison gland and the bee will die. But the thing will still be in your skin and it, the poison gland will still pump venom, the venom into your body. And that's it. And so that when you get stung, you have to scrape that off with your fingernail or with a credit card or anything. You just scrape it off so that it doesn't pump anymore. And then the part, the reason why the stinger works that way is that if a bear comes to the hive, it's good that the stinger stays in its nose, for example, and keeps this bothering the bear, you know, it'll, it'll bother it, and then more bees will come because they smell the smell of that venom. It's, it's an alarm pheromone. It's one of the smells that alarms other bees, and they come and they sting the bear in the nose, and then the bear goes away. Thank you for that. I did not know. I didn't know that it had, like, a pheromone. That's very interesting. Um, we, we received another question from them, and then I think you answered this as well. Um, the smoker, what, what is it that creates the smoke, and what is it that exactly the smoke does to the bees? 
So we use burlap, uh, that's like the coffee bags, the, in old-fashioned coffee bags, it's called burlap. It's a, it's a material that is brown and coarse, and we cut that up into small pieces, and we stuff it into that smoker, and we light it with a lighter, and that gives this white, relatively cool smoke. The smoke just um, disturbs the bee language. It disturbs the, the alarm pheromone, because when we approach the hive, the bees don't really know that it's us. They might think it's a bear, for example, that wants to eat their honey or disturb their brood. So they will get alarmed and they will spray their alarm pheromone, which smells, the, so they communicate with, with smells, right? And one of the smells they communicate with uh, is a little bit like lemon or banana. It's a fruity mix. And if we disturb that smell with our burlap, then they cannot spread that smell, so they don't get alarmed. In addition, the smoke kind of indicates there might be a fire somewhere. So the bees go inside their hive and they go drink uh, honey. They drink open nectar. And that is also good for us so they don't fly around our faces. So it's a distraction, basically. All right. Um, do you, uh, the students are wanting to go ahead and show us how they go ahead and start the smoker. Uh, do you guys want to turn on your audio so we can see? Hello, so here we show you how to start the smoker. So as you can see, I just lit a single piece of burlap, uh, which I then put into the smoker. Uh, so there's a small fire going, uh, and then I can use this part, uh, which just pumps air or oxygen into this part uh, and gets the fire going a little bigger. Uh, and then I'll just continue to add burlap. So the burlap is the material we use in the coffee bags. So, so then you get a nice smoke going there. That's it. And so now you have smoke coming out of this part. Ta -da! Very good. So the the smoke is covering the alarm hormone and the other smell that is produced. And also it's mimicking fires, so they get worried about fires and leave us alone. <laughs> so we have to let a bit peace of mind to work. And we make sure we put it out super well so that we know that we have to fire. That would be horrible. Yep. So we always suffocate it once we're done. We don't ever leave it in the ground so it doesn't start the bush fire. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, it looks like, let me see. I'm trying to see if we have any more questions. Um, but everyone has seemed to, you know, thank you guys so much for participating and sharing this with us. Um, we have a lot of comments that said how fascinating this was and how cool they are, um, especially bees and how well they are with our community. So uh, I just want to take the time to say thank you. Um, if you had missed this live panel, we will be posting it again on Facebook as well as on our social media pages at Riverside Insect Fair. You can also visit our website, Riverside Insect Fair, to also see the live video as well. Um, is there anything else that you guys would like to share? Well, it was wonderful to, to be here and to uh, be able to show uh, the opening of a hive, and we hope to be live at the insect fair really in person next year. We sure can't wait. Thank you guys so much and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.